Hello again. As it's the first day of the year today, at least according to the reckoning which we use, I thought it might be interesting to talk a little about how the year is divided up. And to do this, I'm going to quote from my uh, latest book, which is published this month. This is an account of how the year is actually constructed, which is along the lines that it was during the Bronze Age or the Neolithic, rather than as we have it in the modern world. And in fact, we still work according to the Bronze Age timescale, uh, agricultural and um, pastoral timescale, which is really odd because we don't usually think about that. If you ask anybody today how the year is divided up, they're likely to look at you as though you've asked a very silly question with an obvious answer. Everybody knows the year is divided into 12 months and four seasons, and it begins on January the 1st. What other way could there possibly be? As a matter of fact, the months and seasons are not nearly as significant in the lives of families, including older relatives who might be roped in for childminding or babysitting duties, as the system of seeing the year not as 12 or 4 parts, but rather dividing it into eight. Looked at from this perspective and ignoring the way that we have since the adoption of the Julian calendar in 46 BC, counted the beginning of the year from the 1st of January, everything makes far more sense. After all, the selection of the 1st of January to start the year is wholly arbitrary, although after so many centuries it seems to us a natural way of ordering things. Most people in Britain, and many other parts of Europe, do not talk in terms of months or seasons when planning for the year ahead. We don't in this country. Instead, unwittingly, they divide the year into not 12, but 8 portions. For instance, in January we might say that we should be going away with the children at half term. Or perhaps later in the year we are looking forward to Christmas, or say that the children will be glad of the week off at half term, and that they always enjoy trick-or-treating at Halloween. That the spring half-term school holiday forms around at the time of the Celtic festival of Oymelk, which is spelled I-M-B-O-L-C, or that the week off in autumn coincides with Salwain is hardly noticed. Our year is, even today, divided up into a way which would have been quite familiar to Bronze Age Europeans. The names and celebrations of the festivals have certainly changed, sometimes more than once in the last 5,000 years or so, but often the essential nature of the significant dates has remained unaltered. The calendar which we use today is a relatively recent development and there is, as was remarked above, accordingly no particular significance attached to the first day of January, which we know today is New Year's Day. The old way of establishing points in the year, which were important, was based upon the solstices and equinoxes. In every year, regardless of which calendrical system one chooses to adopt, there will be a day when the hours of daylight last longest. This is the summer solstice, known in the modern world as Midsummer's Day. In the same way, there comes a point in autumn when the opposite point is reached and daylight is at a minimum. Although this is sometimes referred to as midwinter, it's far more common now to celebrate a day which falls a little after the winter solstice and which we call Christmas. In addition to the two solstices each year, there are also equinoxes, which are the days when the hours of daylight and those of darkness are equal. One equinox occurs in the spring and another in the autumn. So far, this natural process, looking only at the way in which the hours of daylight fluctuate throughout the year, has enabled us to divide each year into four points. No calendar is necessary for this purpose. These quarters may then be subdivided once more, but this process requires the keeping of records or counting of days. Then we can work out a time of the year which is midway between solstice and equinox. In this way, the first European farmers hit upon the first important date following the winter solstice, 
which they called Oimelk. It falls midway between the winter solstice and spring equinox. Nobody knows for certain the derivation of the name Oimelk. A thousand years ago it suggested it came from the old pronunciation of words meaning use milk. It's uh, pronounced Oimelk. Modern experts cast doubt on this though, some suggesting it comes from the old Irish words relating to washing oneself. Whatever the truth of the matter, there can be no doubt that Oimel could have been celebrated since at least the Neolithic period or Late Stone Age. Some passage graves in Ireland, most not notably the Mound of the Hostages, dating back 5,000 years, were constructed so that the light of the rising sun on Oimel shone directly along the passage leading to the heart of the tomb. Oimelk falls on the 1st of February in the modern calendar and is associated with lambing and the first signs of spring. It was a time of year when nature was stirring and divination by animals was used in an attempt to predict the weather likely in the coming year, a subject of great interest to an agricultural community. Using animals to foretell the future was not uncommon in the Celtic world and it is a practice which almost certainly predates their culture. It will be recollected that when Boadicea was about to lead an army against the Romans, she released a hare and interpreted the direction of its flight as a sign from the gods promising victory to her followers. On Oimelk, wild animals would be observed and their behaviour used to predict the length of cold winter weather remaining to be endured. An old proverb first recorded in Scots Gaelic has it that the serpent will come from the hole on the brown day of bride, though there should be three foot of snow on the flat surface of the ground. The day of Oimelk was sacred to bride or Bridget. The rule was that if the weather on Oimelk was sunny and bright, then winter was likely to linger on. But if it was cloudy and overcast, then spring would soon arrive. This old piece of divination is still practised in the United States, although perhaps in a tongue-in-cheek manner. Groundhog Day is on the 2nd of February, and if the shadow of the groundhogs, as they emerge from their nests, are visible, then this is a bad omen for the weather over the next month or two. The way in which Christianity has appropriated the religious traditions of earlier cultures may be seen in the name now given to Oimelk, which is St Bridget's Day. Originally, Bridget was a Gaelic goddess cognate with the Celtic Brigantia, or High One. Christian missionaries, though, invented a Saint Bridget and fitted her neatly into Oimelk. She is also sometimes known as Bride. This date is also Candlemas, which is known to as the Feast of the Purification of Mary. This refers to the ritual purification of a woman after childbirth, uh, in Judaism that is. The Christian church has therefore assured itself that it has two strong claims upon 2nd of February, thus making quite sure that Oimelk is more likely to be forgotten. The next important time of year was the spring equinox which comes on the 21st of March. The Christian festival of Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday after the full moon following the equinox. The association of rabbits with Easter as in the Easter bunny has its root in the Celtic reverence for hares which begin their mating rituals in March at about the time of the spring equinox. There's reason to believe that the spring equinox was much, once of much greater significance to the Indo-Europeans than it was after the Christians imposed their own fest festival of Easter, which fell roughly at the same time. One uh, bunch of Indo-Europeans, when they migrated from the Ukraine, passed through Iran. The Persian New Year is celebrated now at the spring equinox, and it's not a festival recognised in Islam or Christianity which suggests it has a much more ancient origin. The real festival to follow Oimelk was, of course, Beltane, and this coincides with what is known as Witches' Night in Germany, and it takes place at the same time as May Day, 
which used to be quite a big thing in Europe, but has faded in recent years. The most ancient point in the traditional calendar, one with special association with fairies, is the summer solstice, which we usually call Midsummer's Day. We know there's a long tradition in Britain of attaching special significance to this day, because of course Stonehenge, which was constructed thousands of years before the birth of Jesus, was aligned so that the sun rises above what is known as a hillstone on the morning of Midsummer Day. The important point about Midsummer Day is that it was a turning point of the year, the hinge if you like, when the days began to grow shorter and the slow march towards winter began. It was a time when the two worlds, the seen and unseen, collided and some invisible things came into sight. When Shakespeare called his play about fairies a Midsummer Night's Dream, he didn't simply pluck the name at random. After Midsummer's Day came the great summer festival of Lugnasad, which was the beginning of harvest time. The old festival which we still commemorate from those days increasingly in recent years is of course the Celtic festival of Samhain, which is roughly midway between the autumn equinox in late September and the winter solstice in December. Today we know this as Halloween. If Midsummer's Eve is a time when fairies are sometimes visible to mortals, then Halloween is the opposite. It's when ghouls and evil spirits walk abroad and it's particularly associated with witches. Halloween has always been a popular time to divine the future, a practice which the church has always looked on with disfavour. The fortune telling today at Halloween is of a fairly harmless nature. Uh, girls can find out things about their future by peeling an apple in one continuous strip and then throwing it over their left shoulder. The peel will then form the initial letter of the future husband's name. I don't know how many viewers have done that. We certainly did it as children. The final festival of the year is one of the most ancient and long-standing of them all. It's the winter solstice when the sun might be about to fade away for good. The days have been growing imperceptibly shorter each, each day since the height of summer and the fear was that the sun would fade away altogether. The Romans devoted themselves to a week of feasting at this time of year known as the Saturnalia. In some ways this was a precursor of the heavy drinking and gluttony which marked the modern celebrations which now centre around the winter solstice in Europe and America. For people in ancient Germany, Britain and Scandinavia, the shortest day of the year was a time when the aid of the oldest and wisest of the gods was invoked. Odin, or his earlier avatars, arrived either seated on a horned beast or in a chariot drawn by a pair of animals with horns. He came in the middle of winter to assure mortals that the sun would return to warm them and the days lengthen again. Sometimes Odin was known as the Yule Father. The visits of the Yule Father have been a long tradition in Northern European folklore before the first Christian missionaries arrived. Odin paid the house a visit, um, gave the children little presents. This is the origin, of course, of Father Christmas. Odin, All-Father, the uh, king of the gods, had a hood which hid his face. He only had one eye, and the hood made it uh, impossible to see that he lacked an eye. He arrived accompanied by his cult animals, uh, horned creatures, either reindeer or goats. This is the ancient cycle of celebration in Europe, one which has endured for thousands of years. It was certainly well established by the time that monuments like Stonehenge were being constructed. And it's so familiar that we seldom stop to ask ourselves why our year is altered in such a way. We simply take it as read that the school holidays should fall on the winter solstice and the spring equinox 
and that the longest holiday of all should be in the harvest time. It's always been that way and that's that. <laughs>